Hello everyone, this is the first video for our review for the Comparative and Government and Politics exam. So let us be, let's begin. This will all just be general terms and concepts. So the first one, political socialization. That's how you develop your ideas about politics and about the role of government. Who impacts your political socialization? Your family has the greatest impact, but school does, your peers, uh, class, uh, even the media and the government can impact that as well. And this will eventually become your political ideology, which is the set of values and beliefs that you have about government, about public policy, or politics in general. All right, now as we look at various statistics in government, uh, a comparative government. If you have an empirical statement, that is something that can be proven by facts. It is objective. But if you have a normative statement, that's a value judgment. That is um, subjective. Uh, based on the data that you're looking at, you will make a normative statement. Okay. Correlation versus causation. If you have two variables that are correlated, there looks that there is an association between them, but the relationship is not clear. Oftentimes, this is just a coincidence. Whereas causation, you can prove that one variable changed another. If X happens and it leads to Y and you can prove that it had direct impact, that is causation. Okay, your rights, liberties, and freedom. In a civil society, there are formal organizations and there are informal organizations. They are not part of the government. They operate in public. Okay, civil society, we have voluntary uh, organizations that are autonomous, they have their own uh, organization, they're self-governing, uh, they focus on a different cause, they bring people from different groups together. Uh, again, they are separate from the government. Civil society thrives when you have competition, when you have freedom, equality, fair elections, there's transparency and a democratic process. Your civil liberties are these freedoms such as speech, assembly, religion, property, and the right to a fair trial. But your political rights are the right to vote, you can lobby the government, you can protest, or you can run for office. Okay, sovereignty, state, and nation. Sovereignty is when you have independence as a legal authority over a particular territory. Um, it's based on your right to self-determination. It's based, I think it's just independence. Now, a state is an organization that has control over a given territory. There's a political foundation there. They have policies, and it's a defined territory. Then a nation is a group of people with common traits, such as race, religion, language, and ethnicity. So you will sometimes see a multi-nation state. This will be a state that has multiple nationalities, and sometimes that's a problem. It does lead to civil war. It could lead to one group wanting to secede from the uh, state, and it does sometimes lead to a lack of legitimacy for the government. All right. Democracy is ruled by the people. Okay, Different elements of democracy are free and fair elections. If you have regular and competitive elections, civil liberties, an independent judiciary, you have rule of law, some of these terms I will go over in a second, peaceful transfer of power, and citizens are eligible to run for office. When there's widespread acceptance of democracy, then democracy is consolidated. Um, you have to have multiple parties to choose from in a democracy. And then in a liberal democracy, not only do you have free and fair elections, but you also have civil liberties. In an illiberal democracy, such as Russia, they do have regular elections, and they're, I guess, relatively competitive. Uh, I'm not going to say anything negative about Putin on here, but um, I sh that was just a joke. Uh, but there are people that don't have civil liberties within the country, okay? Uh, legitimacy and transparency. Political legitimacy is the general belief that the government has the right to rule. So what gives a government legitimacy? If there's a constitution, if you have a, have a charismatic leader, tradition, religion can provide legitimacy, or competitive elections. And then transparency, that is when the government is completely open to the public. It disseminates accurate information to the public. It allows things to be circulated freely, and citizens can access whatever information uh, about the government's decisions and the decision-making process. All right. An authoritarian regime 
that's a form of government that has a strong central power and they limit individuals' political freedoms. So now all those freedoms are subordinate to the state. There's no accountability. There's uh, often not any rule of law. You have a lack of choice uh, in the candidates and even the people who are running. They might be vetted by the government and they can weed out certain people. Sometimes political opponents are intimidated to even run. Social media is often restricted in an authoritarian regime. Uh, and the regime can use bureaucracy to distribute benefits to people in return to, uh, for loyalty. For each country, I'll go through the examples of that. All right. Hybrid regimes, those are ones that are both democratic and authoritarian. They have elements of both. Two examples would be Russia and China of countries that are somewhat democratic because they do hold elections, but then the governments are also authoritarian. Okay. Federalism versus a unitary system. All right. So in a federalist system, you have a division of power between the federal government or or central government or national government and the local units. So there's clear division on the national level and the subnational level. Russia is a federalist system. Mexico is a federalist system. And Nigeria is a federalist system. This can make the lawmaking process difficult because if you have a dispute between the national government and the subnational government, but it also allows for a good representation of different ideas and various policies. The United States, which is not on our exam, the United States is an example of federalism as well. We have a federal government in DC. We also have state governments. Now in a unitary system, there is not a symmetrical power sharing. In a unitary system, the authority is at the top central authority, federal government, that's where the authority is. Then that central government can give power to the local units. So all the power constitutionally is at the national level, but they're allowed to give more power on the local units if they want. Great Britain, China, and Iran are examples of a unitary system. And if they decide to give more power to the, uh, to the uh, local units, that is called devolution. Great Britain did this with Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. That's an example of devolution. It does give the government more legitimacy and can avoid possible revolutions. All right, rule of law is when everybody is accountable to the law. It is applied consistently and universally. Rule of law is promoted when there's an independent judiciary, if you have separation of powers, checks and balances. Officials can be removed either by impeachment or a vote of no confidence. Authoritarian regimes, they try to resist the rule of law because they're worried about losing power. So often those regimes are corrupt. They even punish their opponents. Okay. Regime change versus change of government. So if you have a regime change, that means the entire system is different. Regime change is an example of a complete transformation. So for 70 plus years, Pre was in power in Mexico. In 2000, Pre was removed. That's an example of regime change. The USSR goes from the Soviet Union to the Russian Federation. That's an example of regime change. Change in government is when you just have like a new political party in office or new leader. So if you go from David Cameron to Theresa May, that's a change in government. You go to Ahmadinejad to Rouhani, that's in, in Iran, that's a change in government. It's Hassan Rouhani. I hate when I make a, uh, forget something. All right. Parliamentary versus presidential system. In a parliamentary system, the legislature and the executive branch, they're together. They're part of the scene. There's a fusion of their power. So the prime minister actually comes from the legislative branch. So Theresa May was selected as a member of the House of Commons. So that's how she rose to power, although by the time you take the exam, who knows if she'll still be there. In a parliamentary system, if you don't get one party to win a majority, then you're going to need to form a coalition. So multiple parties will have to come together to figure out who the prime minister will be. Uh, and that is what happened um, in Great Britain. The legislative branch can also declare a vote of no confidence in the prime minister. Now, if you have a presidential system, there's a clear separation. You have two separate, branch, separate branches. You have the executive branch and the legislative branch. The executive is elected or selected one way, and the legislative is elected another way. So you could actually have two different parties that are ruling each branch. Okay, 
Both of these systems, however, could have a legislature that has two parts to it. That's called bicameralism. The UK, Russia, Mexico, and Nigeria, they all have bicameral legislative bodies. All right, very, very important here. So proportional representation. So if we have a legislative body and we give seats based on the percentage that the party received, that's proportional representation. So if your party wins 17% of the vote, you receive 17% of the seats, or roughly close to that. So parties are basically competing for multiple seats within multiple districts, and there's a better chance that minority candidates can win a seat in this system. Russia allows this to a certain extent in the Duma. Mexico allows this to a certain extent in its legislative body. Okay, And if you don't Again, we said before, sometimes you will have to form a coalition if there's no one party that has 51% of the vote. Now, the opposite of that is called first past the post. This is what we use in the United States. This is when you have separate districts, one person represents each district, and whoever gets the most votes wins. Winner take all, single member, they call it sometimes first past the post. What happens usually is because you only have one chance to win, it really leads to a two-party system. So uh, people are in the, in the minority parties are usually discouraged from running if you have a first-past-the-post system. All right, corporatist versus pluralist system. In a corporatist system, interest group, okay, so you have interest groups that have specific goals and objectives that they want to accomplish. In a corporatist system, those interest groups, they actually have a formal relationship with the government. They're actually business and labor and the representatives of the government. They come together. They work within the system. Their relationship is cooperative. So business, labor, and the government all together. In a pluralist system, you still have multiple interest groups, but they don't have direct access to the government. They're not linked to any part specifically. So they have to compete to try, think of lobbyists, to try to get uh, influence in the system. Great Britain and Mexico used to be corporate estates, but they are no longer. They are now pluralist. All right. Next, a referendum. This is when the people vote on a specific issue in the government. The advantage of a referendum is that the responsibility now lies with the people. It's far more democratic, and it's, you know, forces a decision to be made in the shuts off debate, although obviously that is a ridiculous thing for me to say, given the fact that Brexit has been an absolute nightmare for the people. When we do the Great Britain video, I will go through Brexit because I'm pretty confident that's going to have to be a question this year. Another example of devolution, I'm sorry, of a referendum is when they voted to give more power to Scotland in the uh, devolution vote. And they also decided to let the mayor of London be elected directly by the people. But Brexit is the one we're going to review. Cleavages are divisions Within society, I'm sure you guys pretty much understand this. It can be any uh, religion, class, gender, uh, urban, rural. Uh, we'll go through some of the cleavages for each of the countries. And leaders sometimes use cleavages to try to get more support, maintain power. Uh, but obviously it also leads to major conflicts like we have in Nigeria and frankly most of the countries. Political parties, I think we know what that is, but if you have a multi-party system, you have more people being represented. If you have a two-party system, it makes it easier for the people to make their decision. They don't have much to research. And if you have a one-party system, you have continuity of ideas and uniform policies. But when there's more competition, it leads to more democracy. All right. Supranational organizations and some other uh, groups here. The European Union is one example of that. Please remember, though, that the European Union's court, that will override any of the decisions by the courts in the home countries. They have open borders in the European Union. There are no tariffs and uh, environmental laws must be followed. Again, Brexit is the key part of that that we'll go over. Uh, the European Union UN, NATO, sometimes even a terrorist group like Boko Haram, they can all challenge the sovereignty of a state. And then you have multinational corporations. 
like uh, I think Shell in Nigeria, they sometimes challenge state sovereignty because they have so much control over the resources, even sometimes over policies. New technologies make it a lot easier for these corporations to spread their ideas. And just be aware that Nigeria is in the economic community of West African states. All right, an independent judiciary. Almost done, everyone. Independent judiciary will strengthen democracy because it keeps up the idea of checks and balances. It really enforces the rule of law. They make sure we have free and fair elections. They need to be able to be separate from the rest of the government uh, policies. And authoritarian regimes try to sometimes undermine this by only appointing judges who will be loyal to the leader, uh, sometimes even rewarding them. And in the worst case scenario, authoritarian regimes simply will just not follow the judicial decisions and they might even just remove judges. All right. A cabinet is the advisors to the executive. They are very much involved in the policymaking process. Cabinet members in a parliamentary system, they come from the legislature. The majority party leader usually will select them. In a presidential system, they can be removed by impeachment. In a parliamentary system, they can be removed by a vote of no confidence. And um, that's basically it for the cabinet. All right. Welfare state and austerity. Welfare state is when you have policies that are designed to help people um, through the government. So health care in Great Britain, that's an example of the welfare state. People pay taxes and they're all part of what's called the National Health Service. We'll review that closer detail when we get to Great Britain. Uh, if you have unemployment insurance, that's the welfare state. If you give pensions to people, that's the welfare state. Sometimes they call it a social safety net. We have social security, for example, in the U.S., now, the opposite, not opposite, but on the other side, if you are really struggling as a government to pay your bills, sometimes you may have to go on an austerity budget. Um, sometimes school districts have to do this if the budget doesn't pass. So if there's a lot of pressure on your financial resources, you say you're going to go on austerity, which means you're going to spend the bare minimum that's required of you. So what would you have to do if you're on austerity? You might have to increase taxes to bring in more revenue. You also might have to cut social welfare programs. All right, these are all economic terms. Market economy, that is supply and demand. That is free enterprise. Laissez-faire, I guess. That's when private property is emphasized. That's when you can make profits. People can choose whatever job they want. There is competition in a market economy. Conversely, in a command economy, there's a central authority that's going to make all the decisions for you. Uh, the government will set all of the wages and the prices and what is produced and Everything is controlled by the state in a command economy. Now, don't get tricked by this. Economic liberalization, that's the market economy. Economic liberalization is when the government does not regulate the economy. There's more privatization. For our country, economic liberalization is really more of a conservative ideology. So sometimes you get confused by that. This is when you reduce the control of the economy by the state. So it's just introducing free market. How do you become, uh, how do you go undergo economic liberalization? It's when you would lower tariffs. That's when you would reduce subsidies to business, stop giving them money. That's when you want everything to be privatized. All right, and why do they do this? They want foreign investment. They want uh, to reduce deficits. They want to build up the economic uh, foundation of the country in a free enterprise mindset. But sometimes the negatives are, if we don't have laws regulating business, it could lead to environmental damage, uh, it could lead to greater income inequality. And globalization is the trend for the last 20 or 30 years where nations are now economically interdependent. Uh, nations are all connected. What happens in one country impacts another. There's a whole system of global trade. Another reason why Brexit has been so difficult. All right, three more slides. A rentier state, putting all your eggs in one basket. A rentier state is when a country has something that is very valuable and they put all of its emphasis on the revenue from that item. The best example is oil. And Nigeria, Iran, and Russia are the three examples for our course. The problem here is that there's no diversification of the economy, so you're totally dependent on the fluctuations in the marketplace. If there's a problem and oil prices plummet, you're not going to make as much money. There's really no incentive to modernize, and in, in the case of some of these countries, tremendous corruption. 
All right, a runoff election. Some countries, Iran, Nigeria, and Russia, they allow the president to be elected in a possible second round of voting. So in Iran and in Russia, if you do not receive 51% of the vote, then you'll have a second round of voting. That doesn't happen too often. In Nigeria, it's a little bit trickier. In Nigeria, what will happen is you have to win 25% of the vote in two-thirds of the 36 states. And if you don't get that, then there's a second round. That happens more often. What's nice about runoff elections is that voters will get an alternative. They can hopefully vote uh, a second time if they if their first candidate didn't get uh, down to the final two. And the difference between a revolution and a coup d'etat, revolution is uprising of the masses, while a coup d'etat, coup d'etat I can't believe I misspelled that, uh, we're going to change it if you don't mind. Coup d'etat is conducted by the military. And the best example of that is in Nigeria. So tried to keep it brief. I hope this is clear for you. I'll put this uh, presentation on Google Classroom as well. And good luck. And I'll talk to you in the next video.